You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, Patreon. How are you? I hope you are well. I'm sitting here with Bob. Hey, Bob. Hello, Matt. Hello, and everybody. What did we just finish, Bob? We just finished an interview with who? Christopher Gwynn. Christopher Gwynn. And he is the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Gettysburg National Military Park. And uh, I, we asked him to come in because last year we went to his winter lecture, which was called uh, Twilight of the Blue and Gray. It was awesome. It was great. It was about the 75th anniversary reunion. And... Uh, he came in, he sat down, he told us a little bit about what went on there, actually quite a lot about what went on there. But let me tell you a little bit about Chris. He is a 10-year veteran of the National Park Service. He's a 2006 graduate of Gettysburg College, and he holds a master's degree in public history. He has worked as an interpretive park ranger at Antietam National Battlefield, Boston National Historical Park, and the National Mall and Memorial Parks, where he created some of the first public programming conducted at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Currently, he's the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Gettysburg National Military Park. He manages and oversees all aspects of the visitor experience and has written numerous articles and journal entries on the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War era. And he is a great person to learn from. And if you listen, you'll find out whether they ran out of the booze or not at that <laughs> 1938 75th anniversary. <laughs> right. That is so important. That is probably the one detail that uh, really, really brought it home for me. Was the <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as I always say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm learning, you're learning. So let's learn together. And Chris Gwynn is going to teach us a little bit about the 75th anniversary reunion. Our guest today is Chris Gwynn. He's the chief of interpretation and education at Gettysburg National Military Park. Hello, Chris. Hey, happy to be here. OK, so the, the first thing I always ask people when they come on here for the first time is why Gettysburg? Why Gettysburg? What does that mean to you? For you, why Gettysburg? What, what got you interested in it, or whatever that word oh, "why" means? Okay. Why Gettysburg? You know, I think for me personally, uh, I came to the battlefield on vacation when I was very young, uh, and it was a side trip, right? So we were doing the stereotypical family vacation, and you know, we're from Massachusetts, and we're going to D.C. or something yeah, like that. Yeah. We stopped at Chocolate World in Hershey, sure, and we stopped at Gettysburg. And to this day, and I'm six years old at this this time, to this day, I don't remember a thing about that Chocolate World visit, but something about here, Gettysburg, captivated me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's anything that you can put words to. It's just, you know, why do uh, why do people like the music that they do? Why right. do people like the food that they do? Uh, it, it was very much that kind of thing where it was just... This is fascinating to me, and I, I've never been able to really explain why, but I know people feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, you know, why Gettysburg? I think people come here for moments of connection and transportation. And by transportation, I don't mean physical movement, but I right. mean they want to to experience something that is kind of beyond their grasp. Maybe they want to they want to uh, try to go back and and see the world through a different set of eyes, and it's the eyes of the men that fought here 156 years ago. Yeah, and and that's a very common, very common answer. We all kind of have the same thing. It's like, I came here as a kid, and I don't know what happened, Yeah, but I'm stuck. And you've been to other <laughs> battlefields. I have, yeah. And they don't do the same thing to you as this place. Well, they do, to no, a degree. Right? But you're not there. Uh, no, true, true, yeah. true. Um, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of working at Antietam National Battlefields. I've, I've worked at uh the um, national monuments and memorials in dc from you know the world war ii memorial to lincoln and they all have very special meaning to me mm -hmm. and I, I love i love the park service and i love these places because they offer you moments of connection and transportation you can sure. go there and it's real and you can be there and you can feel it and it's it's that communing with something that's authentic and real right gettysburg one the story it's it's so it's such a pivotal chapter in american history and it's it's a small park with a big name right mm. americans even if you only know it as you know the gettysburg address and that's really all you know it has that that name recognition yes. you, uh, europeans that come here uh gettysburg has that resonance and I think it's such an honor to be able to work at a place that has that and to tell this story and hopefully to tell it well and objectively. Yeah. 
last winter, Bob and I went to see your lecture mm-hmm. about the 75th anniversary re- reunion. What was the title of that lecture? Twilight of the Blue and Gray. Twilight of the Blue and Gray. I like that. So reunions of, of former enemies, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that it seems kind of strange. Is that a strange thing? Is that a unique thing to the American Civil War or in history? Have we seen this before or since? Well, I would say we've certainly seen it since. And you can even look at uh, some of the events that have commemorated the First and Second World War, and you can see elements of this. You know, prior to the American Civil War, uh, relatively infrequent, I'm sure it happened, but the um, size and scope of what happens at Gettysburg in terms of these blue-gray reunions that happen after the war is really what makes the, the post-Civil War period really significant in terms of these former foes, former combatants coming back to the battlefield together. I guess it's kind of unique, too, because they're fellow countrymen as opposed to the Germans and the French who really don't have to do anything together with each other ever again if they don't want to. Confederates, Union veterans, they're all Americans now again, and they got to figure out a way to get along. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot, I think, that's very unique about how our Civil War concludes and how it ends. Right. But yeah, certainly there's a very different dynamic to these blue-gray reunions than otherwise. So in 1887, there's one. Mm-hmm. Um, is this is this like a big official thing, or is this kind of an impromptu thing? I, I wouldn't call it an impromptu thing, but I wouldn't call it an official thing either. It was what I would call a very kind of organic thing, and it happens on a, a relatively small scale between veterans of Pickett's Division mm-hmm. and elements of uh, the Philadelphia Brigade. So these are two units that end up facing each other on the battlefield on Cemetery Ridge July 3rd at this kind of climactic moment. Okay, so Webb and Pickett. Correct. Okay. And and, and so now how how did that come about, though? Did did somebody get an idea and then say, let's reach out to the other side and see if they want to come over? You know, I think you got to go back and and look more holistically at how the battlefield develops in the the post-war period. So Gettysburg, and I always try to stress this with, with visitors, Gettysburg really begins as a Union Memorial Park. Okay. It's a place where the Union cause is going to be celebrated. It's a place where the Union soldiers who fought here are going to be honored. And it has its origins. It has its genesis literally in the days, weeks, months following the battle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As Gettysburg's civilians, its leading citizens kind of recognize, hey, something momentous has happened here. Something important has happened here. And so they established this organization, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And this this organization of these Gettysburg uh, citizens uh, has as its goal the, the creation of a monument or a memorial mm-hmm. to this Union victory at Gettysburg and the Union men that died here. But the, the radical element of this is that the monument is going to be the land. So we're going to preserve the battlefield. We're going to preserve the hills, the woods, the ridges where this you know, three-day conflict was waged and that's what they do they end up they go out and they purchase land they get a charter from the state of pennsylvania they become a land preservation organization which again is very very new and novel right. in terms of american history that's sure. really not how americans preserved land uh, previously right. right you know if they preserved land at all it was you know washington's home at mount vernon it wasn't a uh, battlefield park right if you will right so they go out and they preserve this land and end up creating this park And that allows Union veterans in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s to not just come back to the battlefield, but to leave on the battlefield some kind of tangible reminder to future generations of who they were and what they did. And that's the monuments in the battlefield. Of course, that's what that is. And so if you look at the battlefield in the the post-war period, if you look at Gettysburg, there are large numbers of reunions. There are large numbers of veterans coming back to the battlefield and gathering and communing with one another, but it's primarily Union veterans. So the 72nd Pennsylvania is going to come back to the battlefield. That regimental association will come back Mm -hmm. and they'll have a reunion. The 2nd Massachusetts surviving veterans, they'll come back. They'll have a little reunion. These blue and gray reunions, though, the ones that get the most press, the ones that get the most attention, these, these reunions that seem to captivate imagination more than these others are these blue and gray right, reunions, right. which are relatively rare. They, they didn't happen a lot. Mm-hmm. 
part of the reason they get so much attention even today is that it's a rather unique and novel kind of thing to have happen. Sure, These yeah. former combatants coming back to the battlefield. Yeah. And you uh, want to see them getting along. We want to see that. Sure. We don't want to see people fighting. Sure. And I would say even, you know, if you were to go out and, and talk to the veterans themselves, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we want to get along. Yeah. Provide, there's caveats, though. Okay. There, there's limits to that. We'll get along. I was brave. You were brave. <laughs> yeah. We're but all I was brave right. together. I was right. Oh, right, right. And you were wrong. And if you can admit that, it's, you know, it's generally the limits of these, yeah. these reunions. But that's the hardest part, though, is admitting the other guy was right, right? Oh, Isn't sure. it easier to admit, yeah, 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 you're braver than me, right? That's well, yeah, easier. I think you can always, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, yes, we were both brave. We both fought for what we believed in. But Union veterans, they were right. Yeah. And Confederate veterans are going to say, well, you know, just because I lost doesn't mean I was wrong. Right. And so, you know, one of the things that really fascinated me about these reunions is this kind of tension uh -huh. that's there. And so often we see images of these reunions and they're really uh, they're great to look at. They're heartwarming. These old guys shaking hands across the stone wall. But to delve deeper into that story was what really fascinated me to get beyond kind of that facade that right. patina of right. kind of romantic memories <laughs> and get to some of the more contested issues that were at the heart of these things well okay now so there there is a handshake across the wall in the uh 1887 reunion between webb and pickett's men mm -hmm. that's but that's not the famous photograph everybody thinks of no and and what i would say is that that handshake across the wall between Pickett's veterans and Webb's veterans. Mm -hmm. That was very much an almost organic expression that happened at that moment, right? So these are two former combatants that are meeting together on the battlefield. It wasn't necessarily choreographed the way that these future handshakes across the wall right. were. Uh, it happens again in 1913. It happens you know, every, every Remembrance Day in Gettysburg. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah. the famous yeah. photograph that I uh, really was captivated by is uh, from the 38 right. reunion. And it's a very famous photograph. I'm sure your listeners have probably seen it. But it's these two, you know, impossibly old men <laughs> shaking hands across the rock wall at, mm -hmm. at, on Cemetery Ridge uh -huh. near the angle. Not at the angle, but near the angle. And again, if you were to look at that, that picture certainly tells a story. Sure. These These two men who maybe 75 years before were doing their best to try to destroy one another, have been able to put that, that bitterness and rancor aside and can now come back to the battlefield and as, as brothers and as countrymen again, uh, bridge that divide that separated them in life and also ideologically. Right. But if you really look at that photograph, if you really try to pick it apart and examine it as a cultural artifact, I think, I think it paints a very different story. And I remember the first time I looked really critically at it. It's um, this, this beautiful photograph. And you have this solitary Confederate on the left and this little knot of uh, Union veterans on the right. And they're right. kind of milling about with the exception of the one gentleman who's reaching across the wall. But if you look very carefully, there's a wire that runs down the length of the wall. And right beneath these two clenched hands, right, right beneath the handshake, is a microphone. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, you know, well, that, this is this is not some sort of organic thing. These two guys didn't just randomly bump into one another and there happened to be a photographer there. This was a really well choreographed moment. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was well choreographed. They scheduled buses to bring these guys out here. The cameras were set up. It was, it was a staged photo shoot. So what you have, in this 38 reunion and this 38 image of these two guys shaking hands across the wall, not so much this organic act of brotherhood, but a carefully choreographed piece of stagecraft to kind of uh, showcase this narrative. Mm -hmm. And the narrative of the reunion in 1938 was all about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. The horrors of war are behind us, the scars of combat have healed, we're countrymen and we're brothers again. That was very much the narrative that was uh, right. uh, portrayed. But it's interesting, though, because, you know, you have at the 1887 one, you have an organic handshake. Yeah. <clears throat> and then it's done over and over again as media becomes more 
prevalent uh, motion pictures and radio sure. and things sure. like that. And and people are able to have it. Hello, Gettys Nerds. It's Matt. And I hope you enjoyed that preview of our premium content that can now be found over at Patreon.com. I just want to let you know that Addressing Gettysburg will always have free content for you to listen to in the forms of our narrative episodes like Antietam to Chancellorsville and the upcoming episode entitled Invasion, June 1863, Appendix episodes, and our wildly popular Ask a Gettysburg Guide episodes. But episodes like Antietam to Chancellorsville take months to produce as things are now. I hear from people almost every day asking how long until the next episode is finished. And the answer is, when I have the time, I can do it. Your support at Patreon can cut down the time it takes to produce an episode by months. Maybe you don't care about that. Maybe the Ask a Gettysburg Guide episodes are what you like, but they leave you wanting to learn more. Well, fear not. More is what Patreon is all about. Patrons receive access to new premium episodes each week. These episodes are straight interviews or discussions with licensed battlefield guides, rangers, local historians, academics, authors, public historians, people from the Gettysburg community who do impressive things, and frankly, just about anyone who can talk on a subject related to Gettysburg. I want to make sure that the interest you already have in Gettysburg is enriched with our premium content. Your support means the world to me, because that means it will be easier to produce content that will bring Gettysburg to more people and, hopefully, more people to Gettysburg. And the podcast episodes are just the beginning. So please, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash addressing Gettysburg. And become a patron. I thank you in advance.